natural disasters, and man-made catastrophes. Events that can cause enormous loss of life, destruction, and hardship. In desperate hours, you'll become an eyewitness to some of the most noteworthy disasters of the last 100 years. This episode is bound to hit viewers where they live, which is really where we all live, inside our own bodies. Earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, volcanoes, and all the cataclysms that threaten human life. All of them are terrifying in their own way. But perhaps nothing is more chilling than the threat of disease, of epidemics. No other disaster feels more personal than something that literally gets under the skin. And in recent times, the threat of not merely an epidemic, but a pandemic which could annihilate mankind has somehow never seemed more real. But before we hit the panic button, let's brace ourselves by calmly and coolly examining the facts. Ebola. Humans and some primates are vulnerable to this disease, which is a particularly unpleasant one. Between a couple of days and three weeks after contracting the virus, its symptoms become all too clear, starting with fever, a sore throat, headaches, and muscle pains. But that's just a preview to the horror show that comes next. Vomiting, diarrhea, and skin rashes, malfunctioning liver and kidneys, internal and external bleeding, including, in some cases, blood leaking from the eyes. It gets worse still. Around 50% of recorded infections have resulted in death around a week to two and a half weeks after the symptoms of Ebola first appear. Ebola, Ebola, even just from the sound of the name Ebola, it's frightening, you know, it's scary. And these people eventually uh, end up dying and some of them have had actual minor bleedings from the mouth, their mouth. People will think it's not a big deal and then it will get out of hand again and continue to spread for weeks and months and years and that's what we have to stop. By the time people are dead with the Ebola, they are more infectious than all. So if they take care of their burial or their own, 10 more will be infected. We might tend to think of Ebola as a recent development but actually, it was first identified in 1976 in a village near the Ebola River. The scientist who named the disease Ebola, one Peter Pyatt, is now director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Although he first identified the virus in a village named Yambuku, he decided to spare the little town the stigma. Thus, Ebola got its name. Since its detection, the disease has flared up several times. Between 1976 and 2013, the World Health Organization reported a total of 24 outbreaks, including 1,716 fatalities. Bad enough, you might think, but in 2014, things took a turn for the worse. In March of that year, the World Health Organization reported a major outbreak in the West African nation of Guinea. The disease quickly spread to Liberia and Sierra Leone, Guinea's closest neighbors. On August 8, 2014, the World Health Organization declared the epidemic an international public health emergency. Medicine Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, described the situation in Liberia as catastrophic and deteriorating daily. Such was the fear and panic caused by Ebola. It actually kept people away from hospitals, leaving some patients with other conditions without proper treatment. Well, the outbreak isn't contained, so collectively we're not doing enough yet. 
uh, which is not surprising since this is the first outbreak in West Africa, so the governments are not experienced in responding to this. Their health facilities are completely overwhelmed. Uh, poor countries, they weren't all that brilliant to start with. I'm not criticizing them, they're just not. Panic and fear can be much more harmful than the disease itself. Maybe there will only be one case, but the harm that is produced by, by the fear uh, on the economy, on, on, on people, may be bigger. Still, in August of 2014, the disease spread to Nigeria, and one case was reported in Senegal. And on the 30th of September, the first confirmed case of Ebola in the United States ended eight days later with the patient's death. On 29 December 2014, the first case was confirmed in the United Kingdom. The high-level isolation ward at the Royal Free Hospital in North London has been on staff. Even after 30 years, there is still much that is unknown about the disease. For example, although it is known that it is spread by direct contact with the blood or bodily fluid of an infected human or animal, there is still some doubt as to whether fruit bats are a regular carrier, apparently able to spread the virus without themselves being made sick by it but advances are being made all the time and diseases can be eradicated after all it's happened before smallpox, which historians believe was with humankind since the first agricultural settlements about 10,000 BC. Mummified remains of Egyptian pharaohs contain the first definitive evidence of smallpox in the ancient world. Though the first written accounts of the disease didn't appear until the 4th century AD in China. It rampaged through Europe in the Middle Ages, and later, in the 18th century, was said to be responsible for the deaths of five reigning monarchs. Characterized by blisters on the face, arms, and legs, the last case of smallpox in the US was back in 1949, and one other case was in Somalia in 1977. The WHO certified that smallpox had been eradicated in 1979. This was just five years after one of the most serious outbreaks of the 20th century. It happened in India between January and May 1974, where an estimated 15,000 people died, mainly in the states of Bihar, Orissa, and West Bengal. Of the survivors, thousands were left disfigured or blinded. Yet, as we said, by 1980, smallpox was certified as being eliminated by the World Health Organization following their global smallpox eradication program. The Somalia smallpox eradication program recorded the last case in America town, and uh, it seemed to me that uh, this was the last known case of smallpox in the world. This was a big change for people in India and parts of Africa, where smallpox had long been considered a routine fact of life. However, it does seem at times as if the ingenuity of scientists and doctors is in a constant arms race against diseases that can mutate and take on a new form. Case in point, cholera. In straightforward terms, cholera is an acute intestinal infection caused by eating or drinking contaminated food or water. The time between infection and the first symptoms is sometimes less than one day five days at the most. The symptoms are diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and unsurprisingly, severe dehydration. Without proper treatment, death can come on fast. Prevention is better than cure, 
but when treatment is really the only option, then the faster, the better. Number one is rehydration. That's the replacement of lost body fluids using ORS, oral rehydration salts, namely salt and sugar mixed in with clean drinking water. Intravenous fluids and antibiotics all have their part to play in a cure. These are hardly luxury items, but when cholera strikes in a developing nation, they can be scarce commodities. Once the, the bacteria does get into the water supply or gets into the food chain, um, it's, it's very hard to contain without those basics, without the rehydration fluid and without clean water. We know that, uh, that over the last 12 months we've seen reported cases of about 19,000 uh, outbreaks of uh, cholera. We also know that over 1,000 people have, have died as a result of that. The first recorded cholera pandemic ravaged the Bengal region of India beginning around 1816 and lasted some seven years. Highly contagious, cholera spread to Southeast Asia, China, Japan, the Middle East, Southern Russia, and around the world. Pandemic cholera outbreaks wreaked havoc throughout the 19th century. Ironically, the spread of cholera was helped by advances in technology, transport, and the mass movements of migration. However, it wasn't until 1854 before an Englishman named John Snow identified its primary cause as contaminated water. But from 1992 onwards, the so-called El Tor strain has been the dominant strain in all new cholera outbreaks. Testimony to the disease's ability to mutate and adapt. Since 2010, El Tor cholera outbreaks have occurred in places such as Haiti, South Sudan, Mexico, Pakistan, and Sierra Leone. In a world that has become as connected as the one we live in, how can mankind ever hope to stop the spread of disease? This is Heathrow Airport. On average, about 200,000 people arrive and depart from here every day. If just a handful of them are carrying a highly infectious disease, the potential consequences are, well, sobering to say the least. That's just a geopolitical reality. But what can you do to personally stay safe? Because as we all know, prevention is better than cure. The Mayo Clinic in the US recommends washing your hands regularly, staying at home if you do fall ill, getting vaccinated where appropriate, practicing safe sex and other common sense measures, like preparing your food hygienically, As for the proverbial big picture, as you can imagine, scientific researchers are always looking for new ways to stop illnesses from upgrading to epidemics. And never has this been more critical. As the publication Science Alert reported in December 2008, climate change, along with increasing populations, overuse of antibiotics, and global trade and travel, can affect both the likelihood of a new disease emerging and the opportunity for diseases to spread to new populations. Dr. Julie Lynn Hall, who is a communicable diseases expert with the World Health Organization, has made the point that we are seeing the return of diseases like cholera and malaria, previously thought eradicated. But also, for the last three decades, the WHO has seen the emergence, on average, of one new communicable disease per year. And apparently, the incidence of new syndromes is on the rise. This is a global concern. So where do we look for answers to understand how diseases spread and how to contain them? The study of societal networks can help us understand how diseases can spread. The fact that diseases pass from one individual to another via certain types of contact, and that any given individual only has a limited number of contacts, is the starting point for this kind of statistical analysis.
That may sound a little abstract, but success in containing the spread of potential pandemics like SARS and avian bird flu suggests these studies are time well spent. Humanity still battles with maladies that have literally plagued us for centuries. New and deadly diseases have made themselves known in the new millennium. Notably, SARS and bird or avian flu. Beginning with SARS, short for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The disease was first reported in the Guangdong province of China. It is believed it was transferred to human beings from Chinese horseshoe bats and from a feline-looking mammal known as a civet, considered something of a delicacy in that region. <laughs> Generally speaking, SARS begins with a high fever, temperatures higher than 38 degrees Celsius. Other symptoms include headaches, general discomfort, and bodily aches and pains. Mild respiratory symptoms at the outset, a dry cough, and in some cases, diarrhea, are all indicative. Most patients also develop pneumonia. However, no two cases of SARS are precisely the same. The disease can run rather different courses depending on a patient's age and level of fitness. A critical point seems to be around the third week, when the young and strong often start to improve. For the less fortunate, this is when the disease becomes more severe, when the lungs become clogged with fluid and debris, and more aggressive treatment is applied, such as mechanical ventilation. This is certainly not effective in all cases. Worldwide, the death rate from SARS seems to be about 10%. In 2003, the illness spread to more than two dozen countries before it was contained. It's remarkable that the disease was effectively contained when you consider how easily it is spread, specifically by person-to-person -person contact when someone infected coughs or sneezes. The situation we are facing now is an extremely serious situation. Never before in the whole world, the healthcare system has been put under such immense stress. Now over 200 nurses and doctors fell ill to this illness. According to the WHO, some 8,098 people worldwide contracted SARS during the 2003 outbreak. Of these, 774 died from the disease. Tragic for all those people and their families, but things could have been worse, a lot worse. Once again, the WHO worked with governments of many nations and stemmed what could have been a global catastrophe. Avian influenza, known more informally as avian flu or bird flu, is an infectious virus that spreads among birds, and in some cases, human beings. Now, of course, most diseases that affect birds are not harmful to human beings. But two strains in particular have emerged in recent years that can be fatal. Even though these viruses are not thought to be transferred from one human to another, 
thousands of people have been infected since the first outbreak was detected in 1997, resulting in hundreds of fatalities. It was in that year, in China, that a strain of bird flu known as H5N1 laid waste to geese on a Chinese farm. The disease was found to have infected humans during poultry outbreaks in Hong Kong in 1997. 18 people were infected, six of whom died. It was unclear how the disease was being passed from birds to humans. Just the same, a mass culling of all poultry in Hong Kong may have prevented a global epidemic. Uh, we have just started the uh, chicken slaughtering uh, operation in the Changsha Wan temporary poultry market. And we estimate that the number of birds to be slaughtered today will be in the range of some uh, 40,000 uh, birds. For a time, it may have even looked as if H5N1 had been eradicated. But in December 2003, it was back. Reported first in South Korea, where it caused outbreaks in commercial poultry farms. In January 2004, severe respiratory illnesses in 11 children were reported in Hanoi, Vietnam, that was soon confirmed as H5N1 bird flu. By the end of the month, there had been more than 400 outbreaks in Vietnam. The disease was then detected on a Japanese poultry farm in Kyoto. By the end of January, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, and China reported outbreaks in poultry, and in Thailand, two more human cases were confirmed. No strain of avian influenza had ever infected as many countries all at once. Thailand and Vietnam recorded a total of 35 human cases, 24 of which ended in death. It soon became apparent that despite all the efforts to control the virus, it had become endemic, which is to say, permanently present in parts of Asia. Migratory birds and possibly the poultry trade have since spread the virus to over 40 countries. What's more, the virus is now genetically different to the one first detected in Hong Kong in 1997. The current strain, known as the Z strain, has been shown to be more pathogenic, capable of infecting an expanding range of animals, including pigs, as well as cats and dogs. So are we fighting a losing battle against a global killer? The longer the virus is circulating in animals, including chickens and ducks, the greater the risk of human cases, and consequently, the higher the risk of a pandemic virus. Well, in all scenarios, we take into account that up to 30% up to of the population might get sick over a 15-week period. Yes, it's a very difficult matter. Eradication will come in many years. It's a matter of many years. Ebola and cholera in Africa, SARS and bird flu, principally in Asia. All of them diseases with frightening potential to go global in a flash. Smallpox we seem to have defeated, but that's what was thought about cholera just a few years back. If we as a species are to endure, we have to be ever vigilant as individuals. Don't forget to wash your hands before you handle food, for example. But we must also be able to act collectively against the spread of disease. Because when the enemy are literally germs, it's well to remember epidemics don't recognize territorial borders.
floods, fires, earthquakes, tornadoes, natural disasters. When these kinds of phenomena occur, they bring with them loss of human life, often on a massive scale. Tragic environmental devastation, plus destruction and hardship to spare. Arguably though, when it comes to man-made disasters, we have a different responsibility. Our focus for this chilling but fascinating episode of Desperate Hours is on nuclear and industrial disasters. Nuclear power depends on harnessing the energy released during one of two processes, nuclear fission or nuclear fusion. In both nuclear fusion and nuclear fission, energy is released from the high-powered atomic bonds between the particles within a nucleus. The nuclear energy produced can then be used to generate electricity. Ironically, nuclear power is a relatively clean source of energy, which is great. But of course, unless the utmost precautions are taken in generating nuclear power, then the consequences can go beyond merely disastrous to the unthinkable, the horrific. Fukushima, Japan, March 11, 2011. It was then that a terrible earthquake, followed by a tsunami, triggered a fault at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant to create one of the worst nuclear disasters of our times. First, a series of seven tsunamis, some as high as 15 meters, saw to it that diesel generators at Fukushima Daiichi were shut down. Flood water swamped the generators, causing them to fail. The reactors began to heat up. Even after a plant shuts down, nuclear fuel requires continued cooling, which would usually have come from water being continually pumped into the reactors. With the earthquake knocking out electricity at the plant, emergency diesel generators were deployed to cool reactor units one, two, and three. But only an hour later, flooding from the tsunami knocked out the backup generators. Its immediate impact was felt by tens of thousands of people with homes near the plant. With the plant's critical cooling systems knocked out, it set off a chain of hydrogen explosions in reactors one, two, and three, and damaged the containment structure in reactor four. Particles from the melted fuel sent radiation levels dangerously high, to put it mildly. According to the Japanese Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency, the amount of radioactive cesium that spilled into the atmosphere was equivalent to 168 Hiroshima bombs. It must be said, the efforts of workers at the plant to contain the disaster were nothing short of heroic. In the aftermath of the tragedy, foreign media looking for a silver lining dubbed these workers as the Fukushima 50. なるべく
なるべく効率的にそして線量も多く下げれるようにということを考えていきたいと思っています。And in 2013, the Tokyo Electric Power Company admitted that some 300 tons of radioactive water per day was still leaking from the Daiichi nuclear power plant. Nuclear power has been with us now for 70 years. It was developed during wartime. World War II, to be precise. With the war dragging on in Europe and Asia, there was an arms race going on, the likes of which we have never seen before. The Germans had the edge on atomic power until the early 40s when a nuclear development program called the Manhattan Project got underway in the US. Top secret but backed to the hilt by the government, the Manhattan Project's goal was the development of the atom bomb. Most of the critical research and development took place at a purpose-built facility in the new infamous Los Alamos, New Mexico. Five, four, At 5.30 a.m. on the 16th of July, 1945, the Los Alamos scientists successfully exploded the first atomic bomb. Robert Oppenheimer, Enrico Fermi and their team had unleashed the staggering power of atomic reaction in a way their predecessors could only theorize about. Less than a month later, on August 6th and 9th, 1945, the first atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They remain the only two such bombs ever used in warfare. Nuclear testing, however, went on for decades, such as the 1950s, when this footage was taken over the Pacific of an atom bomb detonated at Enwateca Atoll. With the end of the war, scientists also began exploring the peaceful applications of nuclear energy. Though strict security guards the Atomic Energy Commission's laboratories in America, newsreel cameras are permitted to report on how the deadly radioactivity of atomic power is being put to work, not for destruction, but for the benefit of mankind. The first ever nuclear reactor to produce electricity started up in 1951 in Idaho. The experimental breeder reactor was admittedly very small, but within a few years, the first commercial nuclear plants had begun supplying electricity to the US, Russia, Japan, the United Kingdom and others. But major accidents in 1979 at the Three Mile Island power plant in Pennsylvania and in Chernobyl, Ukraine, seemed to cast the shadow of doubt over the future of nuclear power. The very name Chernobyl has become a byword for disaster. Not surprising, especially when you take into account that 10 times more radiation was actually released at Chernobyl than in Fukushima. It happened during a routine reactor systems test on April 26, 1986. A sudden and obvious unexpected surge of power destroyed Unit 4 of the Soviet-era nuclear power plant. In the destruction and the fire which ensued, enormous amounts of radioactive material were released into the environment. Just as at Fukushima, there were desperate concerted efforts to contain the situation. Helicopters flew over the burning reactor, pouring sand and boron from above. This was meant to douse the fire, halt any additional emissions of radioactive material and thwart further nuclear reactions.
They also cut down and buried around a square mile of pine forest in the surrounding area to reduce contamination in the vicinity. And tens of thousands of people were evacuated from the region. Within six months of the tragedy and at great personal risk to the workers involved, a makeshift concrete cover was built over Reactor 4. The purpose of the so-called Chernobyl sarcophagus was, of course, to protect the environment, which was hoped it would do for decades to come. At an emergency meeting of the International Atomic Energy, Soviet officials presented their initial accident report. They estimated that radioactivity from Chernobyl would cause over 25,000 deaths over the following 70 years. A book, Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment, wrote by three eminent scientists, however, put the death toll at approximately 985,000. Directly after the meltdown, Soviet authorities sealed off the power plant within a 30-kilometer radius. Hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated, some directly after the incident, many more in following months and years. The new sarcophagus will be the largest movable man-made structure ever built on land. With radiation immediately above the reactor still much too intense for this new enclosure to be built over the top of it, nearby land was cleared and decontaminated. Новый безопасный конфаймент должны построить в 15 году. Поэтому всех в 15 году приглашаю сюда на площадку, чтобы посмотреть, как уже арка будет буду построена. However, these kinds of massive engineering works often encounter bumps in the road. The revised date for its completion is now November 2017. The IAEA doesn't actually keep a complete database of all the nuclear accidents to date. In 2011, however, the Guardian newspaper compiled a list of 33 serious incidents at nuclear power plants dating back to 1952. But nuclear power doesn't need to be involved for an industrial accident to have tragic consequences on an epic scale. A natural disaster, such as a volcano or earthquake, is something we have little to no control over. Safety in the workplace and care for the environment are a different story. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill, known also as the BP oil spill, began on the 20th of April 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. The Macondo Prospect was a BP-owned oil rig situated some 66 kilometers from the Louisiana coastline. On the evening of April 20th, a surge of natural gas blasted through a concrete core intended to seal the oil well for later use. The gas ignited on the oil rig's platform, killing 11 workers and injuring 17. On the morning of the 22nd, the entire rig capsized and sank. As it did, the so-called riser was ruptured. This critical piece of hardware is the pipe which connects an oil rig to an offshore oil well. With that, oil began to discharge into the Gulf of Mexico at an alarming rate. And indeed, this was to become the largest marine oil spill of all time. BP executives initially claimed the volume of oil escaping the damaged well was around 1,000 barrels per day. But US government officials claimed that the leak was more like 60,000 barrels of oil per day. Under intense but quite justifiable pressure from the US government, the local population, as well as environmentalists, and indeed the watching world, 
BP tried to seal the leak in various ways. First, the supposedly infallible blowout preventer malfunctioned. A containment dome in May didn't work either. A method called top kill, in which mud is drilled and pumped into the well, also failed to stem the flow. Eventually, a method called bottom kill was deployed, which involved pumping cement into the leaking well via two relief wells. I don't understand why it took 87 days. It affects our whole economy and our ecology. Well, it's about time. We should have had a backup plan from day one. In the five months since it began, it was estimated that 4.9 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf, with only 80,000 of those captured. It is hardly surprising then to say that the leak's environmental impact was catastrophic. Incalculable numbers of fish and thousands upon thousands of birds, mammals and sea turtles were plastered with oil. Heartbreaking pictures of these bedraggled and ailing animals flashed around the world. In 2014, a New Orleans district judge ruled that BP's gross negligence was chiefly responsible for the disaster, calling their conduct reckless. Of course, in an industrial accident, no amount of financial compensation will bring dead workers back to life or safeguard the environment from long-term consequences. Now, a house of cards. It might be a popular TV series, but you certainly wouldn't want to work in a real one. But in April 2013, in Bangladesh, thousands of factory workers found out that's exactly where they were toiling. The Rana Plaza in Savar, an industrial eyesore on the outskirts of the capital of Dakar, is where workers toiled away making Western designer clothing for as little as $40 a month. It sounds miserable enough, but the sweatshop conditions turned into a hell on earth when the building seemed to implode from within. Survivor accounts were similar to those of earthquake survivors. There was a loud cracking noise. The concrete floor under their feet began to shift, and then concrete pillars and beams collapsed under their own weight. Worse still, some workers had already expressed concern about cracks appearing in the walls of the building. Some of the offices and a bank had the sense to move their people out of there. But the factory workers were told if they wanted to hold on to their jobs, they would have to keep going to the factory. The search for the dead ended a month later, with a death toll of 1,129. Over 2,500 people were pulled out alive from the wreckage. The collapse has gone on record as one of the deadliest disasters in the history of the garment industry. But the factory collapse came only a few months after a factory fire in Bangladesh killed 112 workers, all of them making shorts and sweaters for Western consumers. Disasters like the Savar Plaza building collapse only serve to illuminate the true cost of the high street bargain bin.
Over 30 years after it occurred, the Bhopal gas disaster is still considered the worst industrial accident of all time. It was the result of negligence and incompetence on the part of a pesticide manufacturing company and government officials. It was in the early hours of the morning on December 3rd, 1984, that wind carried a grey cloud of poisonous gas from the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, India. Some 40 tonnes of the toxic gas, methysocyanate, or MIC, had been accidentally released from the plant, and it spread through the city, poisoning everything it touched. To this day, there is disagreement about where and how the leak was sprung. Local activists and government officials contend that routine pipe maintenance created a backflow of water which spilled into a tank of MIC. But Union Carbide Corporation contends water entered the tank after an act of sabotage. Whoever was ultimately responsible, the result was a nightmare without end. Over 10,000 people were estimated to have died outright. As residents woke up to clouds of the suffocating gas, they began running through the darkened streets to local hospitals. By the time they got there, out of breath and often blinded as well, the damage was already done. The muscles, brains, lungs and eyes, the gastrointestinal, neurological, reproductive and immune systems of the survivors were affected. On the morning following the leak, the Bhopal streets near the gas plant were like a scene from a horror film, with the difference that the carnage and devastation was all too real. In many ways, uh, people are worse than they were on the morning of the disaster. There are at least 150,000 people with chronic illnesses as a result of their exposure to the toxic gases. And uh, now we know that the next generation is also marked by Union Carbide's poisons. To this day, December 3rd remains a day of mourning in the Bhopal province, and the environmental impact will take many, many years to be forgotten. So there you have it. There are disasters and there are tragedies. And in this installment of Desperate Hours, we have seen both. As we have touched on before, the effects of natural disasters can be heartbreaking, catastrophic, the source of so much human suffering. But it's the incompetence and greed, negligence and arrogance of man that makes these nuclear and industrial accidents so especially tragic. In the wake of such tragedy, there is always a recrimination and pursuit of retribution. But often what has been lost can never really be recovered. And if that hasn't made you think twice about safety in your own workplace, we don't know what would.